Good morning or good afternoon. Um, happy Sunday to everyone from wherever you're calling in from. Welcome to the Student Conference for Social Work Day at the United Nations. This event is hosted by Monmouth University, Fordham University, and Rusk Records University, and it is sponsored by the International Association of Schools of Social Work, the Institute for Clinical Social Work, and the International Federation of Social Work. Happy Social Work Month. Happy Women's History Month. We are delighted to have you here. I'm Hannah Burke. I am one of two co-chairs for this event. And I'm Shanae Osborne, the other co-chair in this event. Please see the program for today's event as Hannah shares more introductory information. So we want to encourage everybody to feel free to share your name, your pronouns, and where you're from right into the chat. We will also be sharing a voluntary Google form that you can fill out, which will be converted into a spreadsheet and shared with everyone so we can begin building a network together. Also, please note that this event will be recorded. So if you prefer to not be recorded, please feel free to turn off your cameras. The breakout rooms will not be recorded. The theme this year is Ubuntu. I am because you are. We invite you to enjoy the short video to learn more about Ubuntu. The word Ubuntu seems to have some um, mysterious or origins. Um, some say it's a causal word, some say it's, um, it's just a word from a southern African Nguni language. But the concept of it is um, is definitely one that is shared among all the different ethnic groups of uh, that comprise South Africa. Ubuntu is something when you've got a heart of a person. At times, people me I always define Ubuntu differently. Um, you cannot be a person without other people, so you need people. Secondly. Um, Ubuntu must be in you. There is a say that when an African child smiles, he smiles from the bottom of his heart. To show Ubuntu, that has got love of that person that he sees or that he is, is greeting. I won't be afraid to say that at times you find that our people are getting lost. We have a, such a unique tradition. And if you remember when Mandela was jailed in 1962, when he went to court, what he was wearing, he was wearing a blanket, a blanket, this blanket, it has to do with the ancestors, we call it Ingawe. Our fathers, they will sit around the crawl looking at the cows and cattle wearing that blanket. So whenever you're going to do something, there is a traditional costume that you wear well, I think the concept of, of Ubuntu is the, the principle of, uh, of humanity uh, beyond, uh, beyond borders. For me, the most wonderful music comes out of the traditional music. And at an early age, I realized this wonderful complexity of the traditional music. And it's not as simple as it is, uh, it is uh, uh, said to be. So it, it opened... Uh, 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 the self self investigation you know, of ourselves as uh, personally and also of our communities and of the nation. What is it that we have inherent today besides the gold and the diamonds and the uranium in terms of our culture? <laughs> We hope you enjoyed that and continue to keep Ubuntu in mind. So now I would like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Michael Cronin. Dr. Cronin earned his master's in social work at Columbia University and his PhD at Yeshiva University. Dr. Cronin's research interests and publications are in international social work, healthcare and social policy, disaster management, social innovations, environmental justice, social gerontology, international humanitarian law, cultural competence, and diversity. 
Prior to taking his position in academia, he worked as a social worker for over 20 years in New York City, assisting individuals and families in a variety of settings. Dr. Cronin serves in a leadership capacity to several domestic and international organizations. He is a volunteer leader with the American Red Cross in Greater New York and serves as the United Nations Commissioner for North America for the International Federation of Social Workers. He completed a Fulbright during the 2019-2020 academic year in the capital of Ukraine, Kraiv, where he facilitated several capacity building projects, including curriculum and faculty development. Michael, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, when Hannah and Shanae approached me about speaking with you today, they asked me to discuss the challenges that we're seeing and perhaps the positives of how um, they may remain permanent for future education. Uh, living in a world uh, co uh, with COVID-19, we've learned a lot. So in the few minutes I have with you today, I will do my best to kick us off. Um, first, I have a, a click, clip, which is a compilation of the pitfalls and joys of living in a world of Zoom and other related platforms. Think about how this has changed our social and educational lives. I hope nobody recognizes themselves. <laughs> Will be done by ground carriers, so people won't be getting their medication dropped out of the sky into their mailbox just yet. But the companies do say they will scale up the program if it is successful, guys. Very cool. We love it, Will. Thank you. I think it really depends on just like the ethical standards of the profession. And in reality, I've heard that social work kind of has very high standards and and like <laughs> like good standards in terms of things and that oftentimes people don't like people of other professions don't have the hold on hold on <laughs> what happened i saw nothing <sighs> oh my god Poor jennifer obviously um, and do stop me if you need to crack on do do tell us What's his name? My, My name is Christian. His name is Christian. Christian? Yes. I am just deciding where it comes up where Mummy wants it to go. Oh, right. Where does Mummy want, want it to go? Want to I think just on that shelf is great. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Already do it. Um, kids do it. YouTube kids do it. And the BBC are also now embracing this. Why, and I apologise for my cat's tail, why, um, why are you not doing this by default? <laughs> Rocco, could you tell them? <laughs> yeah, whatever. Guys, we can hear your conversation okay, and we don't want to. So you can go hang out with Callista, like you're doing class every day. I don't know about this. When did you add her on social media? Like literally five years ago, mm -hmm. Natalia, before I ever knew you had done that. Hey, Natalia. Oh, I wish I never met you. Hey, Natalia. Natalia, can you mute yourself? Uh, vi har ikke fått alle detaljene som kommer med detaljer på, på det på torsdag. Og som, som sikrer at selskapene nå får et mer tilgang til uh, penger gjennom... That's how it's going to be. Oh, oh, <laughs> Let's make sure everybody has clothes on. <laughs> oh, guys. Wait, no, your your video is on. They don't even have good regiments to keep the data to make sure that um I'm sorry, I <laughs> the bird just landed on his head. It's okay, it's okay. Sorry, <laughs> All good. Over. All uh, good. <laughs> Tony! Tony! Can you hear us? Tony! Oh no! Tony! Jen, call him! <laughs> Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh 
Hold on, I'm gonna text a couple pictures of that. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh. Oh. Yes. Oh boy. <laughs> What's up? Tony, I can see you. We can all there. see you. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you enjoyed enjoy that. Um, and for the record, I am wearing pants. Um, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to focus on um, some new emerging research, uh, something that I thought I coined the phrase, but I realized there are lots of scientists that are actually working on this more than me, something called Zoom fatigue. Um, Stanford researchers have identified four causes uh, for Zoom fatigue and their simple fixes, which I'm gonna share with you today. It's not just Zoom, popular video chat platforms um, have design flaws that exhaust the human mind and body, but there are easy ways to mitigate their effects. Even as more people are logging onto popular chat platforms to connect with colleagues, family, and friends during the COVID-19 pandemic, Stanford researchers have a warning for you. Th those video calls are likely tiring you out. Prompted by the recent boom in video conferencing, communications professor Jeremy Balenson, who is the founding director of the Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Lab, examined the psychological consequences of spending hours per day on these platforms. Just as Googling is sometimes akin to web search, uh, the, the term Zooming has become ubiquitous and a generic verb to replace video conferencing. Uh, virtual meetings have skyrocketed with hundreds of millions happening daily as social distancing protocols have kept people apart physically. In the first peer reviewed article that systematically destructs, uh, deconstructs Zoom fatigue from a psychological perspective was published less than one month ago. Valenson has taken the medium apart and assess Zoom on its individual technical aspects. He has identified four consequences of prolonged video chats that say contribute to the freely commonly um, known as Zoom fatigue. Balenson stressed that his goal is not to vilify any particular video conferencing platform. He appreciates and uses tools like Zoom regularly, but to highlight how current implementations of video conferencing technologies are exhausting and to suggest interface changes, many of which are very simple to implement. Moreover, he provides suggestions for consumers and organizations on how to leverage the current features on video conferences to decrease fatigue. Video conferencing is a good thing for remote communication, but just think about the medium. Just because you can use video doesn't mean you have to. I will share with you the four primary reasons why video chats fatigue humans according to their study. So the first one is excessive amounts of close-up eye contact is highly intense. Both the amount of eye contact we engage in video chats, as well as the size of faces on screens is unnatural. In a normal meeting, people will variously be looking at the speaker, taking notes or looking elsewhere. But on Zoom calls, everyone is looking at everyone all the time. A listener is treated non-verbally like a speaker. So even if you don't speak once in a meeting, you are still looking at faces staring at you. The amount of eye contact is dramatically increased. Social anxiety of public speaking is one of the biggest phobias that exists in our population. When you're standing up there, everyone's staring at you. That's a stressful experience. Another source of stress is that depending on your monitor size and whether you're using an external monitor, faces on video conference calls can appear too large for comfort. In general, for most setups, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation when you're with coworkers or even strangers on video. You're seeing their face at a size which stimulates a personal space that you are normally experience when, you, when you're with somebody intimately. When someone's face is that close to ours in real life, our brain interprets it as an intense situation that's either going to lead to mating 
or to conflict. What's happening in effect when you're, Zoom, when you're using Zoom for many, many hours is you're in this hyper aroused state. So a solution could be until the platforms change their interface, it has been recommended to take Zoom out of the full screen option, reduce the size of your Zoom window relative to the monitor to, maximize, uh, to minimize the face size, perhaps use an external keyboard to allow an increase in personal, personal space um, as well, so you can actually move around. The second point that they make is seeing yourself during video chats constantly in real time is fatiguing, right? I'm always looking that, is my hair okay? Is that the right shirt? Does it look good with the, vacuum, with the background? Most video platforms show a square of what you look like on camera during a chat, but that's unnatural. In the real world, if someone was following you around with a mirror constantly, so that while you were talking to people, making decisions, giving feedback, getting feedback, you were seeing yourself in a mirror, that would just be crazy. No one would ever consider that. So balance incited studies showing, showing that you see a reflection of yourself. You are more critical of yourself when you do that. Many of us are now seeing ourselves on video chats for many hours every day. It's taxing on us, it's stressful. And there's a lot of research showing that there are negative emotional consequences to seeing yourself in a mirror for so long. So a simple solution it could be recommended that the platform changes the default practice of becoming, of beaming the video to both self and others when it only needs to be sent to others in the meantime. Users should use the hide self um, button, which one can access by right clicking your own photo and only see their face framed. Once you see their face framed properly, then you can sort of shut it off. Um, that's a less distraction. The third point. So in person and audio phone conversations allow humans to walk around and move. Um, like when I'm in the classroom, I'm always moving around, tripping over something. Um, but with video conferencing, most cameras have a set field of view, meaning a person has generally has to stay in the same spot. Movement is limited in ways that are not natural. There's a growing research now that says when people are moving, they're performing better cognitively. Solution. Recommended that people think more about, about the room they're video conferencing in when the camera is, where the camera is positioned and whether things like an external keyboard can help create distance or flexibility. Uh, for example, an external cam camera for farther away from the screen will allow you to pace or doodle like you would in, in a regular meeting. Um, and turning your camera off periodically during meetings is a good ground rule to set for groups just to give oneself a brief nonverbal rest. And I've started to in, in institute that in my teaching, where um, even though there's lots of research about um, trauma-informed teaching, that, you know, there might be reasons that, that people, you know, can't or, you know, are not comfortable with showing themselves on screen, um, it doesn't have to be every minute as many of us professors um, like to do because we feel like we're teaching in a, in a vacuum. Um, so maybe little snippets of now you can turn your ca camera off and write down a few things or do those kind of things can help break it up. The fourth and final point that the research makes is the cognitive load is much higher in video chats. So in regular face-to-face -face interaction, nonverbal communication is quite natural. And each of us naturally makes and interprets gestures and nonverbal cues subconsciously. But in video chats, we have to work harder to send and receive signals. In effect, humans have taken one of the most natural things in the world, an in-person conversation, and transformed it into something that involves a lot of thought. You've got to make sure that your head is framed in the center of the video. If you want to show something that you're agree that someone that you're agreeing with them, you have to do an exaggerated nod or that, you know, uh, thumbs up. That adds what we call cognitive load, and you're using mental cal calories in order to communicate. Gestures could also mean something different in a video meeting context. 
a sidelong glance to someone during an in-person meeting means something very different than a person on a video chat grid looking off screen to their child who just walked into the home office. So perhaps a solution. During long stretches of meetings, give yourself an audio only break, not simply turning off your camera to, to take a break from having to be non-verbally active, um, but also to allow yourself to turn away from the screen for a few minutes so that you're not smothered with all these gestures and that are percept perceptually realistic, but socially meaningless. And in closing, there is some new research about how to measure this. Um, Many organizations, including schools, large companies, and government entities, have reached out to Stanford communication researchers to better understand how to create best practices for their particular video conferencing setup and how to come up with institutional guidelines. Valensin and others at the Stanford Social Media Lab responded by devising the ZEF scale, Z-E-F, Zoom Exhaustion and Fatigue Scale, to help measure how much fatigue people are experiencing in the workplace from video conferencing. So add that to your list of survey research. The scale detailed in a, rec in a recent, not yet peer reviewed um, paper, advances research on how to measure fatigue from interpersonal technology, as well as what causes the fatigue. The scale is a 15 item questionnaire, which is freely available and has been tested now across five separate studies over the past year with over 500 participants. It asks questions about a person's general fatigue, physical fatigue, social fatigue, emotional fatigue, and motivational fatigue. Some of the just a few of the questions are, how exhausted do you feel after video conferencing? Um, I feel like it never ends. Um, how irritated do your eyes feel about uh, after video conferencing? How much do you tend to avoid social situations after video conferencing? How emotionally drained do you feel after video conferencing? How often do you feel tired to do other things after video conference? So that's just a, a preview of some of the questions that they use on that scale. The researchers said results from the scale can help change technology so that the stressors are reduced. Um, we have been there before. We first had, when we first had elevators, we didn't know whether we should stare at each other or not in that space. More recently, ride sharing, right? Uber, Lyft um, has brought up questions about whether you talk to our driver or not, or whether to get in the back seat or the front seat. Um, so we've had, we've had to evolve ways to make it work for us. We're in that era now that video conferencing and understanding the mechanisms will help will help us understand the optimal way to do things for different settings, different organizations, and different kinds of meetings. So hopefully their work that I shared with you today will contribute to uncovering the roots of this problem and help people adapt their video conference practices to alleviate Zoom fatigue. This could also inform video conference platform designers to challenge and rethink some of the paradigm uh, video conferences have been built on. I hope that you have a wonderful conference going further with this subject. Taking care of oneself is ever so important than ever. My dear colleague Martha Bragan will stress the importance of that in her talk. Be well, everyone. Thank you so much, Michael, for that funny video, which I am sure gave us all great laughs, um, and for the wonderful and much needed presentation. It's nice to know that I don't feel alone in my Zoom fatigue because I definitely feel all the things you've mentioned. <laughs> so um, also, if you have a link to the chat for this information, I know that many are interested for the uh, reminders of for future use. So that would be great if possible. Now I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Martha Bragan. Dr. Bragan is an associate professor at the Silverman School of Social Work at Hunter College and the doctoral program in social welfare at the Graduate Center. She is the chairperson of global social work and practice with immigrants and refugees. Dr. Bragan joined the faculty after 25 years of experience supporting governments, non-governmental organizations, and United Nations agencies to address the effects of violence and disaster on children, youth, and families, both in the United States and internationally. 
She is a member of many organizations where she brings a social work perspective to standards on community-led practice with children in emergencies, as well as participatory methods and assessment, monitoring, and evaluation. Her most recent research used participatory methods to develop locally, locality-based indicators of psychosocial well-being for people in countries in conflict, including Nepal, Burundi, Northern Uganda, South Sudan, Afghanistan, and Northwest Syria. Dr. Bragan is a 2020 winner of the Partners in International Education Award by the Council on Social Work Education for her work on decolonizing curricula. Her papers addressing the effects of structural institution interpersonal violence have won the prestigious Tyson Prize and Heyman Prize for the International Psychoanalytic Association. Dr. Bracken, take it away. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And so thank you for the generous introduction and the reference to my well-being studies. In the before times, when we went out to work with communities, I was privileged to be invited to support the study of well being among people affected by war, state, and community violence around the world and in my home place of New York. Social workers often ask people affected by violence about the extent of their suffering and the traumatogenic experience that caused it. However, community members and the social workers who support them led by thinkers from Southern, East, and West Africa and the Americas, did not think that suffering could be simply enumerated and got over somehow, or that addressing symptoms was sufficient to heal. Social work with people affected by violence needed to include processes toward transformation. We learned that from Hanwana in 1998, 99, 2006, Elizabeth Lira, um, Audrey Lord. Ignacio Martin Barro, Opet P. Batik, and Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart among the many. Violence affected community members wanted a chance to give voice to their vision of what it meant to be psychologically, socially, spiritually, and economically well. Communities emerging from violence use these studies so that members can design social work programs for their benefit and then use the elements of well being that they have operationalized to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of those programs based on progress toward the creation of conditions that could allow people to be truly well. While the definitions of each domain of well being are unique to each community that participates in such a study, there's some essential elements that I wanted to share with you today is background to what we want to be talking about. First, to the capabilities necessary to a good life for oneself and one's children, now and in the future. Then there is connection to family, friends, community, and action for change, loving family relationships, loving re friendships outside the family, honoring positive traditions together with community, working with others to make life better in the future, participation in solidarity organizations that support both healing and taking action together and experiencing moments of joy. And here I, um, I wanna ask your forgiveness. You know, the wonderful thing about being a researcher is that you become accustomed to listen and write down and hear what other people say. And today I'm being asked to speak and give examples. And I know I will be wrong about so much. I will admit so, I will omit so much, particularly the experiences of those of you who are not located in the US. I've been stuck in a couple of rooms for the last year and my vision I fear is myopic. Please feel free to share in the chat. So as social work students in the before times until one year ago, you were engaged in education that would also help you to earn a living for yourself and your family. Your profession allowed you a means to think about creating a better future for your community. 
You were doing this in communities that you were rapidly creating. Bravely, you were engaging in critical con critically conscious efforts to interrogate and change the structural, social, and personal violence that created the suffering you were being educated to encounter and transform. You were working together with others and sharing ideas and coffee and love, the occasional hug. Black, indigenous, and students of color, lesbian, gay, but, um, BTQ, two spirits, IA plus students, migrant students, students with different abilities, and all those facing exclusion, hatred, and violence. You were seeking safety and community and hoping for allies. It was not easy in the before times. You were often too broke, too affected by the violence, too overworked and too busy to meet the moment of your education without a tremendous stretch of effort, all that you could find. Then came COVID-19. It immediately laid bare that the structural and social violence on which our societies were founded were undiminished. These facts are reflected in who dies, who loses wages, and who works to serve the rest without adequate wages and supports. In the US, Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Asian Pacific Islander, queer people, people of color are intersectional targets. They're reflected in the epidemic of hate-driven murder, lynching, deportation, incarceration, xenophobia, Islamophobia, transphobia, anti-Semitism, and persecution of all the ex excluded. Yesterday in the US, we mourned the anniversary of the murder of B Breonna Taylor, an African-American emergency technical assistance worker shot down, dead, while sleeping by the police, while sleeping in her bed. We saw parents, elders and community members taken away to die alone or dying in our crowded homes as we stood by helpless. As we survive, we live with family members who cannot isolate and work for low wages to support us and all those around, and become sick and return to work all too soon. We must divide our time between our studies and homeschooling, children and caring for our elders. Some of us are living alone and have not felt a human touch in a full year. We are trying to learn on cell phones without libraries and learning spaces. We have few tools with which to care for the people we serve, let alone the people we love. Work and study demands do not diminish, they increase, and everything takes three times as long on whatever electronic device is available. Please take 30 seconds of silence to be present with, to grieve, and to acknowledge your own experience. Each of you is a precious resource, the hope of our communities, our profession, and the world that is to come. Just as there is no me without we, without each of us, there will be no we. Without each of us, there will be no future. Without each of us, there will be no social work. Each of us, is an essential element required to contribute to the creation of the whole. Caring for oneself is not a self-indulgence. 
It is preservation, self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. Thank you, Audre Lorde said that in 1988. Caring for oneself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. Now take a deep breath, first in, then out. Close your eyes for a moment and take 30 seconds to think about this. Envision the world you want for yourself, for those you love, for your communities, for the generations that come after you. Now let's each of us imagine what we will need to be well, psychologically, socially, material, spiritually, as we create that world. So self-care is not an admonition that we sometimes hear in social work school. It is an act of community and an act of love. Seek inward. What do we need to keep calm, to keep going, even in difficult times? Small comforts, reassurances, little luxuries, perhaps. What spaces of quiet? of nature, of water, of land? What do we need to feel full, comfortable, as though we lived in plenty? Seek outward. What do we want from the world of work to support us on our journey? What do we want from family and community to support us on our journey? What human connections do we seek that will bring us greater strength? What actions do we want to take that will bring us a sense of power? Putting it all together. What resources do we bring to our communities in transformation? To listen well, to imagine well, to dream well, to love well, to inspire others? What will bring us joy? Remember, each of us is precious, a necessary part of the whole. No one of us does everything, and we work best, struggle best, live west, best, when we do what brings us joy. And who will join the standing up and the ones who stood without sweet company will sing and sing back into the mountains and if necessary, even under the sea. You are the ones we have been waiting for. Thank you, June Jordan, in her 1978 poem for South African women. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Bregan, for that wonderful presentation. So now we're gonna transition into our first breakout room session. Um, we encourage you all to share your thoughts and feelings related to these topics presented. Welcome back, everybody. Um, well, we hope you all had enriching discussions. I know I did. I loved that breakout room session. That was great. Um, so now we're going to transition to our next presentation and our next section of the conference. 
Hey, so thank you everyone for your participation in the breakout rooms. And I hope you all learned a lot and had the opportunity to get acquainted with other students from across the globe. So now uh, we will transition to our third speaker, Dr. Annalene Keep, who will be discussing, <clears throat> excuse me, decolonization within the context of social work. Dr. Keat is an associate professor in the social work at Nelson Mandela University, Berha, previously known as Port Elizabeth in Eastern Cape, South Africa. And yes, you did hear me click when I started to say the word Berha. <laughs> so I will put a link um, for the video uh, explaining this word to you um, in the chat after I finish here. Dr. Keat holds a PhD with research interests in social marginalization decolonality, older people, and well-being for the helping professions. Prior to her academic career, she held various senior positions in employee well-being organizations. Annaline is a member of the Executive Board of Association of South African Social Work Educational Institute and serves as an international representative on the International Association of Schools of Social Work. You're up, Dr. Keith. Good. I wanted to say good evening because in South Africa, it's evening already. So thank you very much, everybody, for this opportunity to, to share this presentation with you. I've checked the program that I've received, and I think I've got 15 minutes. And believe me, 15 minutes goes very quickly. So I need to go, and I need to go very quickly. When you were... Okay, so there we are. So this was my brief. My brief was to talk about social work as a force, like perpetuate, uh, uh, perpetuate uh, oppression, the history thereof, and how do we look at it, not just from a Western viewpoint, and how can we do better? And I then do it in this way, dealing with that, looking at the unpack, the concept of decolonization, looking at the remnants of colonization, because I think it's important that we actually go a little bit deeper in that, just to see why it's still necessary for us now, and it will probably be still be necessary for us in 10 years to come to talk about this, okay? And then talk about the, so where do we go from here for social work? So let me see how we, how we go to that. I think we are all way past the, the, the time in our lives where we thought that when we have removed the legal components of the colonial rule, then everything will fall into place automatically. We now know that that is not really true. And we are still dealing with the entrapments of coloniality, not only where I'm coming from in South Africa, where we definitely deal with this, but across the world quite well. So I thought let's just quickly look a little bit in terms of some definitions of when we speak about decolonization. And this is defined then, you know, on, on, on an almost a bit, I will call it as on the surface level of definition, speaks to the act of getting rid of the you know, colonization, of not being, of freeing the self of being dependent on another country. And that sounds like fairly easy, I suppose. But I think if we talk about true decolonization, it seeks to challenge and change white uh, superiority, you know, nationalistic history and the kind of assumed truths that we work with. And decolonization as a process, as a deep process, really then involves us challenging both consciously and subconsciously, the kind of racist thinkings that we get entrapped with very often. I want to take it a little bit further, and I want to look at some of our South African, not South African necessarily, but African and South African scholars that speaks about the concept of decoloniality and also about the dangers of the colonial project specifically. So Ngugi Wat Yong, and some of us here would know uh, uh, the scholar, okay? He, he profoundly speaks to and define the process of decolonialism as that process of searching for a liberating perspective, you know, searching that perspective within which we can see ourselves clearly in relation to ourselves and to others in this universe. And he strongly believes that how we see something, even from our own, through our own eyes, depends on where we stand in relation to that. And if you look at this little picture here, how we view this experience depends on where we stand in relation to that experience. And that tells us how deep we need to go personally as professionals as, and as a profession to really think about the decolonial project. Franz Fernandin, 
goes and then he speaks and why that is necessary might be good for us to look at what Fanon speaks about the dangers and what happens in the process of colonialism. And he says that colonialism works on the past of the oppressed people. And it works of it in, it in a way that it actually distorts, it disfigures. Yeah? And you know these monster movies that we sometimes like to look at, uh, like to watch and how that distorts, you know, figures, uh, etc. And eventually it destroys people's past. And it's because of that reason that colonialism have an enduring significance even many, many years after colonial rule has been abandoned. Okay. And Lovu Kacheni, a South African writer on, on, on the colonialism and what happened to us, he refers to two dangerous mental processes that contributes to that entrapment that I am talking about. And he talks about a mental dislocation where he argues and he said that the, the colonial project, you know, that process of where, where we were trapped in at the time, it has dislocated people's minds from that space that they know. And it has removed them to a point where their point of departure now comes from a foreign place while their body remains local. And that for him is that mental dislocation. So he sees that as a type of alienation that move people further away from their base and they look at themselves through the eyes of a stranger. And as a result of that, he then, it, it then result in what he calls bodiless heads and headless bodies. So that's that he calls the separation of the mind from the body. And this for him happens both actively and passively. And it's active passive distancing ourselves from our reality and, ident uh, and an active passive identification, which is then external from our environment. And that, that sounds and becomes a little bit scary if you think about that. And because he writes so much about the colonial project in, in, the, in the South Africa and in the African context, he also says this and he and, and 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 this is one of those profound concepts and he said what africa knows about itself and what different parts of africa know about each other have been profoundly influenced by the west and this concept that he uses then coincides with the views of Eze, who suggests that what happened in this process you know so what happened in oppressive systems like colonialism, it allows for marginalized groups in society to have the histories and the knowledge systems being misrecognized. And it's written out of the mainstream body of knowledge. So then people are presented to the world through the voices of other people. And those others are often their oppressors. And the public picture of themselves are then often far removed from what they actually know about themselves. And these are the kind of deep psychological challenges that comes with it. So yeah, uh, Nglovo Katsini takes it a little bit further. Now we all, so it takes these different empires, the physical, and we know that when we talk about the physical, we don't have a, a legalized colonial system necessarily in, you know, in, in the areas where we are. But we know that from a financial, a commercial military point, and from the metaphysical point, we are deeply embedded in that project and we haven't walked away from it eff effectively yet. If we talk about the commercial uh, military, then I think thinking about our, our, our more developed countries to, uh, in, 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 in relation to our developing countries, and the, the, you know, the, the power relationships that remain locked in this process and the resulting uh, a, a large scale poverty that is both historical, but also locked in these kind of arrangements that we have right now. And then it answers a question to us as to why we all have different levels of success, even when it comes to the SDGs, the, the sustainable development goals and those targets of how we are able to reach them. But the big part and comes in for me in the conversation, especially in here today, is also about this metaphysical empire. 
So that invasion of the mental universe, and we spoke about that already, that stealing of the history, you know, and at the end of the day, our epistemolo epistemologies as well. And his argument is that as a decolonization, and he speaks specifically, especially about higher education, university curriculums, et cetera, and so on. And, 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 and said that that epistemological decolonization needs to take place. And in fact, this I want to argue is actually to a large extent that Rock's institution of higher education in South Africa, especially from 2015, because students are saying, but I want to see myself in the curriculum that you are teaching, okay? So how does this actually then relate uh, to me, uh, to the conversation of today for social work? And I speak here about the alienation of social work history in South Africa. Now we all know, and part of this brief was to speak about uh, 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 social work and its abuse of, 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 you know, uh, uh, um, of people's rights, for instance. And we know that our globally, our history of social work that is locked into the charitable organizations to serve people in need has been extremely patriarchal, okay? And the power imbalance in that has been taking a long time for us to get to another place. Social work in South Africa is very much the same kind of history. And it's also very much uh, linked and locked into our history of, of, of apartheid and racial uh, discrimination, etc. So this was a profession at the time when social work became a profession in South Africa. Right? It's a profession that was born during the most oppressive period of our country's history with theories and practice models that was imported from the West and the professionalization then took place during this time. So can you see that challenge that one then sits with, okay? Now in this fragmented history and those uh, uh, and, 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 and the, the, the racial fragment, uh, frag, uh, fragmentedness of the South Africa, the training of social workers was also fragmented within different racial groups at different institutions with different uh, uh, quality being given to it, etc. cetera. All right? Yet we had an amazing thing where the training of, even during that time, the training and the presence of prominent black social workers happened also during that time, okay? And, 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 and yet what we see is that that training and the presence of these, these prominent black social workers and Ellen Kuzwayo, Winnie Madikis and Mandela, Bregalia Bum, for instance, they are not written, they have disappeared in the history of social work. And the social work student is not necessarily, they don't necessarily learn about this unless we make the decision that it needs to be included. And I must say, we work very hard to include that. And that for me then refers to what is it calls being written out of history. But it's not just the idea of being written out of history. It's also what it means for where we are as a discipline. Because subsequently then I argue that the social discipline in my country then struggled for a long time and still now have struggles to find that liberation voice. And we often find ourselves complacent towards oppressive practices. And that's the challenge of not de looking at it from there. So I want to just quickly look at taking this a little bit further and bring it back to what Nblovo Katsini are saying about that dislocation and creating the bodiless heads and headless bodies, okay? It's because the danger of a social work theory based and practice based that was imported mainly from outside the social work, outside the context, uh, uh, of which it is practiced, it does result into an alienating process. And then social workers run the, run the risk of viewing the people with lenses that are unable to see them in the context of the historical disruptions that created the uh, social marginal spaces they find themselves in. They also can't necessarily see people, see people sense-making of the environment and their own knowledge systems that they have used all the time. So the social worker's mental dislocation then seeks to reproduce the mental dislocation within the communities that they work with. And that stifles empowerment 
and it stifles transformation. So I know that uh, uh, um, I just want to work well with time, but I just want to then ask, so how do we do this differently? Okay, and I'm going to use this example. And some of us here in the audience might have heard about this. And this is a Zimbabwean example. So the Friendship Benz concept was started by psychiatrist Dixon Chibanda in 26, uh, 2006, sorry. Um, and this is an example of a therapeutic invention that's responding to the needs of the community, that being high levels of mental health challenges and absolute insufficient service provision. And he draws on the role of women as matriarch in the community that they understand well. He, he then recruits women between the ages of 60 and 80 and train them to support people in the community. And what they do is that the assessment of the, you know, the potential mental health issues takes place within the clinics that people attend. And reference are then made to these friendship bins that's usually located close to the clinic. And what is it that he's achieving through this process? So he already addresses a significant shortfall in mental health services in the society. So if I put on my lenses of a radical social worker, I will say, but he's not confronting the structural injustices. But there are other things that he does here. He links formal and informal systems in society. He normalized the conversation on mental health, not from a foreign location, but within the community. He draws on, on traditional knowledge systems, and also he validates older people as knowledgeable and active within active citizens within community. And some of the research that they've already done shows that these people are doing very well. I quickly want to draw to conclusion through a work that's been done by Crampton. And Crampton tells the story of, Zuni, of the Zuni people, and some of my American colleagues here would probably know uh, uh, this history, who for centuries lived in the southwestern part of the U.S. And each year the deer and, and bear clans would carve twin war gods, which are deities of great power that also serves as protectors of time of war and peace. And they are then placed within the landscape to ensure balance and harmony. During that process, they will stay there and they will eventually decompose, okay, into the, into the soil and be part of that process. They're not supposed to be moved. Then you start seeing with the Smithsonian process, uh, 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 period, they created, you know, so here you have these scholars. They collect, they name, and they categorize indigenous cultures in the Grovey and in, in this United States. And they have moved over 10,000 of these artifacts taken from the Zuni people alone. And with the assumption that the value of cult cultures can be captured, they can be capital cataloged, and they can be made permanent through scientific storage and display. To be able to do this, they had to also saturate these, uh, uh, these uh, artifacts with chemicals so that they can be preserved. And we'll find them in the museum, then we could find them in the museums and they will always be captured. However, the harm that has been done through this meant that the Zuni people have actually lost a lot of these artifacts and a lot of their cultural uh, uh, practices. So the irony here would have been that while a museum is something that needs to, 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 um, the, the, uh, to, to preserve something. It has actually been there in this process to destroy. And that's the story. So, so, so Crampton then for social work, and I've got two more, I just got this slide and another one, and then I will finish off with this, okay? Um, Crampton then makes this link of that story with social work, and he indicates that the anthropologists working in this uh, uh, Smithsonian Institute missed completely that by removing these war gods from the original place and their sacred role and trying to ensure a form of permanency of the cultural artifacts in the museum, they completely alienated them. And the preservation of this role required not only for those uh, artifacts to be returned because they have been returned, but they were supposed to be able to decompose and become part of the natural landscape, which it now was unable to do. So he draws from the story and argues that effective social work intervention is responsive and relational rather than self-contained and instrumental. And in this example, 
it was not that the object was stuck in the ground. That was not the main issue, okay? And then this object caused good outcomes. That was not the only things. But for the, for, for, for the Ayudar being successful, it was not supposed to remain a permanent fixture, but it was supposed to break down in the local context, okay? And that breaking down required active, responsive, uh, uh, environment and he's got three lessons here and he says the first lesson for social work is that this intervention success that intervention success actually depends on the active engagement with those in the social environment so that the intervention itself can change over time so a social work intervention that looks the same on the outside as it is on the inside might not necessarily be a natural fit. And as he then, and the second lesson that follows from that is that the intervention work must rather remain local in order for it to engage effectively. The act of removing itself not only prevents, but it also distorts any chance to be helpful. So Crampton then argues that it can be unhelpful if we take best practice that we preserve through our professionalism of, so, of social work and then try to insert that into local environments. So using the same intervention tool in the same way in completely different contexts will not really help us harm more than anything else. And the last lesson that he then, that, that, that Crampton then puts out there for us is the value of impermanence as seen in allowing the breakdown and the disintegration. And that's a challenge for us in social work, that the impermanence in this case is not a disappearance, you know, of the profession or the work that we do, but the, uh, the impermanence, and it's not a loss. Instead, there's a value to this impermanence as it allows intervention work to breathe and it change within the context and then it is active and it becomes responsive to engage and and Crampton then argues that this impermanence is actually a way of sustainability that's the key I think I just want to quickly end off with the last slide I just want to show you a research that the student did so this is a, was a research student of mine I'm not going to go into the context I don't have the time and it's not my story to tell but I just want to use the, the the process and this student was looking at wanted to look at the role you know of, of, of the impact of absent fathers on the the, the navigation into adulthood for Isikosa young people, because there's a lot of traditional context that needs the presence of the, the presence of the father figure. In long conversation, she changes and she then looked at the, 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 the role of the social father rather than the absent fatherhood. By doing that, she was able to look from the inside. She herself being an Isikosa woman, and yet if she used the other concept, it would have been easier to look through the eyes of a stranger into this thing that I'm supposed to know, okay? So looking from the inside, she could then acknowledge that extended family systems organize their roles in unique ways. And this allows the social, and this allowed her as a social work researcher to become a student of the research participants. And she could generate knowledge that can enhance the spread for social work intervention. If she did it the other way, using a Western construction of family and ignoring the historical disruptions that forcefully kept fathers from their families to earn meager salaries in the mines. She would have probably been able to risk, she would have been able to pathologize more than half of South African families. Thank you very much. That is all, you know, in, South, in, in Afrikaans, I will say my flight flight, my story is as eight. And if we watch movies, it normally goes and says, the end. Thank you. I will stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Dr. Keat, for that incredibly important presentation on this incredibly important topic. Um, so we will now go back into breakout rooms. We're all going to discuss decolonization to better understand how we can integrate this important topic into our personal and professional lives.
Welcome back, everybody. We hope those discussions were very thought provoking for you and just one more step in the everlasting continuum that is lifelong learning. Um, so this has been an absolutely wonderful experience and we cannot thank you all enough for attending the first ever Zoom event for this global day at the UN Student Conference. Um, Ubuntu really is the perfect theme for today's event because it was truly a team effort. I am because you are. So we'd like to thank our hosts and sponsors, as well as our amazing speakers, Dr. Michael Cronin, Dr. Martha Bragan, and Dr. Annalyn Keat. And we would also like to thank in advance Dr. Marciana Popescu, who will be speaking in the half hour bonus session right after this main event about international work as a social worker. Can, can I just jump in for a second? Absolutely. And say that I hope to see everyone on Tuesday when we hold UN, um, I mean, Social Work Day at the UN at noon, New York time. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in as well and say a couple quick thanks before we end the main session. Um, we wanted to thank the rest of the planning committee, Professors Rebecca Davis, Shirley Gatenio Gable, Elaine Congress, Robin Mama, and Sergei Zeleniev, who guided us immensely through this process. We also wanted to thank the tech team at Fordham, Trish, Matt, and Connor, without whom this could not have run so smoothly. And finally, we wanted to thank our student facilitators, Anna, Foga, Tenzin, Jesse, Janelle, Emmy, Courtney, Christy, Sophie, Anmol, Firdaus, Carlos, Modupe, and Joel. Without your help, this wouldn't have been possible. Um, so in the networking forum, there was a question about a quality survey. I'm gonna be dropping that link in the chat. It's entirely voluntary, but we would really appreciate it if you took the time to fill it out. It should only take about three minutes and it will be very, very, very helpful for us in planning next year's student conference. Thank you. Okay, so now time for our half hour bonus session for anyone interested in international social work. I would like to introduce you to an amazingly accomplished person. Um, I have the honor to have her as my professor and um, she's extremely accomplished, Dr. Marciana Popescu. Um, she has done a lot of humanitarian work all over the globe. She's a human rights advocate and migration scholar, born, raised, and partially educated in Romania, currently teaching at Fordham University in New York. Dr. Popescu is an international scholar and educator interested in interdisciplinary rights-based approaches to research, policy, and practice, study migration policies, particularly in regards to forced migration and the impact of current policies on women. Dr. Popescu developed and applied an experimental learning model to teaching international social development to graduate students with a study tour component to the Dominican Republic, Peru, and Haiti. She has increased interest in the intersection between global compacts, especially with regard to migration and refugees and the sustainable development goals and their application to policy development, change, and to practice. She's a senior Fulbright scholar and a specialist and the member of the UN NGO Committee of Migration representing the IASSW in this committee at the United Nations. Well, thank you very much. Oh my God, it was way too long and you didn't need to know all those details, but thank <laughs> you so much. Now I feel really uh, under pressure to live up to everything that you described. Um, very happy to be with all of you today and thank you to the committee for inviting me to jump in and cover this session. And I do hope that it will lead to more questions than answers because in my opinion, uh, that's what it means to continuously learn. We will continuously find more questions that we want to ask so we can continue to grow. So today I will scare my, my I will uh, share my screen with you a little bit, but it will be a very brief presentation, hoping to leave enough room for some discussion. So when, when Shane approached me, uh, she said, you know, like, oh, I would be very happy if you can join us. What could you speak about? And of course, international social work came to mind. But as I was putting together this presentation, I was thinking it is extremely relevant that we are talking about international social work while we are, you know, looking at one year of pandemic and trying to make sense of what happened, 
of where we are and of where will we go next. So this is why I think it is relevant to talk about international social work in the context of the global pandemic. So if you're thinking of year 2020, I'm sure you keep asking yourself, what did it mean for me? What did it mean for my community? What did it mean for the world? And hopefully this will take us where it should take us. But you know, if you really look at the global pandemic, right? What we know is that as of today, there are almost 120 million confirmed cases, right? Over 120 million confirmed cases, over 2 million deaths. Yet, we see that the response is being created. So, you know, it's not, it's not a small thing. We are dealing with this public health issue that affected the entire world. Now, when you're thinking of that, it is very interesting that the previous speaker that I had the, the privilege to listen to uh, talked about nationalism and decolonization and the importance for social work to understand, you know, the role of colonization in shaping our profession and the ways in which we need to challenge that. Well, the global pandemic basically brings us to another cross point, to one of those moments in time in which we need to reconsider what are we doing? What kind of practice do we want to engage with? And where will we go from there? So if you really think of the global pandemic, while this was happening, there were at least, and this is not exhaustive, there were at least four other major issues that populated last year. Did not start last year. They were not new. The global pandemic was somewhat new, somewhat unexpected, but this was not. So if you look at all the others, like, first of all, you have racial justice, right? We did have the Black Lives Matter movement and similar movements around the world. And if you're thinking of the previous speaker, you know, this is part of the increasing nationalism, the increasing xenophobia, the otherization. And you must wonder, how do we play into that picture? How is social work contributing to otherization or to decolonization, to inclusion, right? So racial justice is a very important item still on our list. What do we do with it? Next, we deal with environmental justice, right? When you're thinking of environmental justice, some of the issues you know, on the global scene that we need to think about that, and when I say global, this means US as well, okay? Global means, the entire world. Some of the issues linked to environmental justice that we as social worker, workers will interact with are the food insecurity issue, right? So we are in the midst of a pandemic. Do people have access to food? How is the environment and the environmental justice aspect contributing to you know, lowering access to food? What about water? You know, one of the first measures that was put forth in preventing the spread of the virus was what? Wash your hands. Is this something easily available to all? Where is water less accessible? You know, how is environmental justice playing into this, right? Then you have economic justice, and probably this is the most talked about. But as social workers, we take a different perspective, right? So you talk about economic justice, of course, the first thing you'll hear is the universal basic income concept that was brought back to the conversation. It's not a new concept. Actually, The Economist ran a whole issue a few years back on this concept of universal basic income. Yet, now it became much more important, right? But why? For us as social workers, why is it important? Because this leads us to really considering the whole notion of a safety net. Do we have a safety net? Are we working towards really improving, strengthening the safety net? What needs to be added? from reconsidering minimum wage, right? To really looking at universal basic income and what does that mean? To moving towards universal support systems, right? This is something that was on the agenda of last year and it's still on the agenda. I, I hope we'll keep it on the agenda for us as social workers moving on. And then you have social justice, like what does social justice mean in the context of the pandemic? I will just mention two aspects here. One is, oh, well, three. One is remote learning, right? Now, if you really think of remote learning and this concept of social justice, who has access to what? How can people, how can children stay 
within systems of education that already came with major gaps and disparities in the context of a pandemic. What does it mean to use technology as a tool to really increase inclusion? How can we do it in plugged systems of public education in the United States and in plugged systems of education around the world when access issues were not fully resolved? And then you have health and mental health care, right? In the context of a pandemic, this became extremely important not only because of the pandemic, but because the pandemic exacerbated the lack of access to care. So we are talking about people that not only now live with the anxiety of possibly getting sick and not being able to receive treatment, we're talking about people that historically did not receive treatment, right? And you're talking about healthcare, it's one thing. You're talking about mental health care and the problem explodes. So these are the major four issues that I wanted you to think about today when we're talking about what does it mean to be an international social worker in the context of the global pandemic, right? Because they reframe the way in which we think. Now, when the global pandemic happened, it was framed, it was, it was presented, it was described as a public health crisis, right? And then we ended up on March 11, having it declared as a global pandemic, still very much linked to the health field. When you are looking at all these other four dimensions, what we realize is that the global pandemic actually created what in the humanitarian literature is being referred to as a complex emergency. Because we already had all these other issues bubbling at the surface with roots that were very deep and were, with root causes that were never fully addressed. Crises that were ongoing actually making these aspects forces that really shape the impact of the pandemic for different population groups, right? So what? When we are talking about international social work now, maybe one thing that this pandemic reminded us is that we are part of the world. We are not isolated. We're not living separately in our own communities, in our own countries. We are affected by the world and the global issues that are ongoing. Therefore, we have to assume responsibility for these issues. What do we do? Where do we start? And as international social workers, we start here, right? Wherever you are. But instead of looking inward, which by the way, this look inward increases otherization, we, can, we need to start looking outward, okay? Where do I go from here? What systems do I need to understand? What knowledge do I need to add? So I can become an active participant to addressing global issues through my profession, right? With this being said, there are some new and existing challenges that social workers, particularly, but not only, working abroad, social workers, international social workers, would need to address. One is the intersection between the ongoing intersection. This is not new. Again, I'm not telling you much, many new things here. I'm just reminding you what you already know, right? So there is an ongoing intersection between international social work and public health. We need to be able to talk across disciplines because as we can see, public health in general and public health in particular has social have social determinants that are extremely important for us to address in order to do what? To prevent other complex emergencies, to make sure that we start addressing some of the root causes. And we work with nurses, we work with doctors, we work with health practitioners, we, we work with community health workers to really see where are the gaps? What needs to be addressed? How do we make sure that water is accessible to all? That hygiene is being placed at the top of the list? That access to preventive care becomes part of the policy packages that are popular and are promoted and advocated for, and that social workers work in integrated healthcare teams that can provide an integrated response, right? That's one aspect. The other, and I'm sorry, I had to bring this up, I wanted to edit it earlier, is migration, particularly forced migration. Why? Because the pandemic reminded us that this is an ongoing challenge. 
We are dealing with borders that have been defined and shaped in multiple ways, mostly to keep people out. We are at a point where we need to really relook really at what is happening around the world and in our own backyards. Okay? What means for people to have the freedom to move? How is that being regulated? Where are the social workers when it comes to really understanding migration, understanding free movement, influencing policies and influencing practices from the point of entry into the country to wherever the people are being resettled, relocated? From the point of entry to their you know, birth countries if return processes happen? Because when I'm saying that borders need to be reconfigured, that doesn't mean necessarily that we dismantle borders altogether, although I have my personal opinions on that, but it does mean that we start looking at what does it mean to have people coming in, exercising their human right, because I hope everybody here agrees, you know, we have this human right of applying for asylum, seeking asylum, having their day in court, going through due process, whatever that due process is, and that's something else we need to look at. And if their grounds for asylum are not found to justify asylum, if there will be cases in which people will be returned. But what does that mean? And where are social workers in this process? About 10 years ago, there were, I was at the conference, I was presenting at the conference and we had one social worker that was working within the governmental migration sector in the United States. And she actually said that at that time, there were 27 social workers involved in the governmental migration sector in the United States. I'm, I'm talking about forced migration, right? So where are, where are social workers and should social workers be included? Absolutely, this is part of what social work in general, international social work in particular is about. We understand systems. We learn how to work across dis disciplines. We look at root causes of issues. We use a lot of process thinking. We are goals oriented, but not only, we're also process oriented, right? So bringing us into the mix, we're actually bringing social workers and training social workers to work in those contexts becomes extremely important. Poverty, you know, like when we are looking at poverty, you know, I know you hear this talk all the time and social work, fortunately or unfortunately, is associated with poverty. It's like the, the, the profession linked to poverty. And I think I would be proud to be seen <laughs> as, you know, like really being linked to poverty, if my main goal is to make sure that poverty is being eliminated. How is that being eliminated? By challenging currently safety net systems, seeing where the gaps are, advocating for different policies and practices, right? And making sure that there are protection mechanisms in place. So no one falls through the holes of a, you know, like really meager, if any, safety net. Education. Again, we are looking, I was having a conversation this morning and the reality is we will not go back to what was before 2020. This is why 2020 becomes one of those major episodes of change, you know, they will talk about before and after. Education changes. How do we make sure that the new modes, the new approaches to education will ensure inclusion, will increase literacy, will increase financial literacy, and I'd say will increase human rights literacy. Because you know, many of the policy discourses that social workers get engaged with are starting at, with the public discourses that we have a responsibility to engage in and shape from within. And then finally, I would say, and this is my challenge for all of you, no matter what social work practice will you end up with, what kind of work will you do? Innovation becomes extremely important because things will not be the same. Because whatever we did, the methods, the practices that we had in place, some of them we need to keep and build and strengthen. Many of them were not necessarily conducive to more inclusion, to higher levels of well-being, to making sure that this profession leads to increased capacity at all levels. 
also bringing in all the voices from the margins. And they, that's why innovation is important. Also, you know, let's be honest, because we will deal with financial stringencies more and more. You know, there was a huge discussion this, this, this week at one of the um, United Nations uh, International Labor Organization conversations. It was a well, webinar on Thursday. And the conversation was about funding for development. How is that being affected by the pandemic and by the economic crisis that the pandemic, you know, runs us all into, right? So as a social worker that will depend on funding, international social worker even more so, working with international NGOs that are competing many of the times for similar resources, we need to be innovative. Looking at those initiatives that can actually grow capacity at the local level. Okay. Looking at funding that will become seed funding to basically <laughs> make us obsolete to some extent. So we won't be needed all the time by all communities because that's what our goal should be. But we can reshape, reframe, reinvent ourselves and create innovative responses that will always be needed because the world is always changing. So with this, I'm coming, I promise I'm about done. I'm trying to verify the time here. I'm running out of time. Um, you know, like here is like some areas of practice and I quickly go to some of the like the main elements that, you know, should help you decide what you want to do. So, you know, we talk about social work. I, I, I should start that I do believe that social work is a generalist holistic profession and it should include all areas of practice, right? We tend to talk about social work in the United States in particular, you know, using this like very distinct categories, uh, clinical or direct practice and macro or macro could include leadership and then we can have policy and we can have research, but it's very distinct categories and that leads to a silo approach that we need to move away from, right? And try to think, okay, how can we work in a more inclusive way? In international social work, there are different directions you can take. One is humanitarian social work. Why? Because we are dealing with an increasing number of protracted emergencies, protracted crises, complex emergencies, such as the pandemic, in which you have multiple balls in the air, multiple crises going, what do you do? You go in, you want to really assess the situation. And when you do that, you need to understand crisis response. You need to understand complex emergencies. You need to really shape interventions that are both time sensitive and interdisciplinary in their nature, but also can link to more sustainable approaches going on building the know-how while providing an immediate timely response. International social development is a wider dimension of social work practice, basically that is very well framed right now, but what, by what we call the Sustainable Development Goals Framework. You can work with that framework and apply it to reconfiguring what international social development from a social work perspective is about. And you know, you'll see two elements there. One is capacity building. What could social workers do there? Well. One of the important aspects of capacity building is working with communities and learning from communities to then bring in new skills and knowledge as needed. One tool that was used internationally, it's not new, it's called the training for trainers approach, one mechanism, training for trainers, which means I'm not going in to save anyone. I hope we are way, way removed from that approach. I'm going in to learn and to provide whatever I can bring based on what I learn. So capacity will be built there, working with community health practitioners to address human rights issues, but having them address them because I do not understand the human rights issues in communities the way they do, right? That's just an example. The second element of international social development, that that's why I said the sustainable development goals works very well is sustainability okay whatever we do we need to create policies and practices that will be sustainable which means what what means to have a sustainable practice they will not be dependent on ongoing funding and on your presence in those communities they will eventually become self-sustainable working towards creating mechanisms that will be in place to address the, on, the, the, you know, the coming issues that we'll be dealing with and the ongoing issues that need more interventions going forward. And then there is the more general global human rights work. Now, what is this about? 
This is a way in which social workers internationally and locally can engage in promoting human rights. And how do we promote human rights? We're promoting human rights through language, foreign language. Yes, as an international social work, you might want to invest in a foreign language, but it's not only that. But when you do talk the language of the community, what do you say to the community? And how is this a rights-based approach? You are communicating, you matter. I am not expecting you to make the effort. I am making the effort to speak to you in your own language, right? This is why as international social workers that are rights-based, I do encourage you to really look into investing in a foreign language. But it's not only about that. When you speak the language, you still need to think of what does it mean to have an inclusive language, a rights-based language, understanding the terminology, being sensitive to words that can hurt, creating user-friendly documents and user-friendly materials, not speaking to the people at the profession, in a professional lingo that situates you somewhere up, making them feel less than, right? Direct practice, what do we need to do to really reshape direct practice and make sure that it is rights-based as international social workers? The first and most important thing is cultural humility realizing that you, you cannot just train, I'm sorry to say, you know, you are at Fordham, you're training, you're like really investing into your education. That's amazing. That's great. But that doesn't mean that you go to a different community, to a different country and have all the knowledge already. We don't. I don't. We continuously have to learn and acknowledge that there is so much more that the communities that we are working with can teach us. I need that understanding, right? You need to really see, say, I don't know what it means to live with this experience. Teach me, right? You're looking at access, you know, like what you go to a country, you go to a community that's not your own and you'll have access to resources that other people don't. And that's when these questions of access need to come up, okay? How do we make sure that through our direct practice, working as community social workers, you really increase access. And that goes to inclusion as well, because when you look at access, you look at who is being left out. So being able to engage voices in the community, to work with people in communities will help you do that. Um, advocacy, international social work is closely linked. Like you will do a lot of advocacy, I hope you will. I hope you start it here, I hope you start it now. Because advocacy is about access and access is part of this, you know, tri-dimensional approach in which we are looking what services are missing, what is not there, what are the resources that are not available. If they are available, how come not, how come not all the people reach them? So it's an access issue. And if they are available and access barriers have been addressed, how come they are not utilized? Is it something that's linked to our misunderstanding of the community, our lack of understanding of the community, our inability to create ownership and make sure that people will see this intervention as their own. And then ultimately leadership. All of you here are leaders. What does that mean? It means that you are leading with the communities you are working with. That participatory leadership becomes extreme, extreme, extremely important. It means that you are accountable to the communities you are working with. It's a new approach to leadership. How do I do that? Well, I create mechanisms to make sure that people can provide feedback. I also show how I'm using that feedback in order to improve the response. And then I'm using research. You saw, you see that I didn't mention that research, I put evidence-based, why? Because this is why we use research, to create evidence. But the question for you, rights-based international social workers, is what evidence do you create? What evidence do you use? Whose evidence do you use? And how is that shaping practice? So yes, there are multiple skills that international social workers need, but I want you to think in, within this wider context not only to build your skills just because you want to work internationally, but to really think, what do I actually want to focus on? Financial literacy, being able to write grants, being able to talk a foreign language, this is all important, but doing it in a rights, human rights framework, knowing what the human rights framework is about, understanding which are the documents that we need to fight to ratify in our own country, such as the CRC, the CEDAW, uh, the International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, 
this, uh, this comes first in my mind. Familiarize yourself, know what is happening out there, know what skills do you actually need to really project you or really prepare you for international social work, no matter what you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Popescu. Wow, you have definitely given us a lot of information to ponder and reflect on. Your presentation has provided us important knowledge, which will uh, help us to just question how we can become more active participants in addressing global issues. I know that we are running slightly longer than anticipated, um, but I think we can get a few questions in for Dr. Popescu and hope that we could just finish by around 2.15 if that's okay for everybody. We just um, kindly ask that you raise your Zoom hand and then we do apologize in advance if we don't get to all of your questions, but we thank you so much for your participation. I also wanted to add that you can share my email address and I would be happy to answer more specifically and more in a more personalized way some of the questions that you might have. Also some of the questions for, my, for which I might not have the right answer right now. Uh, but uh, yes, so that would help us. Thank you, I'll take care of that right now in the chat. Great, okay, so I'm just gonna start us out with our first question. We have one from Foga, who is one of our facilitators. Um, thank you so much, Boga, for your question and for your participation. So he writes, thank you very much for the presentation. You bring up the issue of aid and funding and the need for innovation, given that we are competing for the same funds. I think this brings up an issue of capitalism and an issue of colonialism for me. Do you think yes. that social work, especially nowadays, is over NGOizing human suffering? And don't you think, especially with international aid and the imperialism of solidarity, Social work in this manner perpetuates colonialism, and instead of designing pro programs for human communities, these are designed to fit funders' requirements best. Wow, this is a great, great question. Thank you so much. And I would start by saying one thing that we need to try to be very careful with is overgeneralizations. If we talk in general terms, yes, in many ways, social work participated in colonization. Social work can participate in, you know, colonization and marginalization of different vulnerable groups. However, there are amazing initiatives around the world that really engage social work in a different way, in which social workers are working with communities, you know, really focusing on what, what capacity in this community needs to be strengthened by what resources. As long as talking about the over NGOization, <laughs> I managed that word, that is a caution there. Like, you know, as long as you look, like if you're really looking, there are quite a few books already written on the, on the topic when you talk about international development in general. You know, like we are, we are having many NGOs operating around the world, but I have to give you, the opposite situation in which I come from a communist country in which you could not have any NGOs under communism because all actors had to be state actors. So when you're thinking about that, try to think of NGOs as part of the civil society, which means that a strong democracy needs to have a strong civil society. Therefore, the government needs to create policies that would allow the NGOs to function. With this being said, we need to look at the nature of NGOs at the focus of NGOs. Are they hiring locally? Are they hiring internationally? Do they have major differences in pay? And the UN is, is really challenged on this, right? Um, what does it mean? If most of the, your staff is international, how do you create you know, ownership locally? How do you contribute to building capacity locally, but you do have NGOs that are really very intentional about, you know, not only hiring locally, but creating local leadership, right? So eventually people would be able, international workers would be able to withdraw because now you have capacity locally. There is an ongoing tension between making sure that aid continues to be provided wherever is needed and making sure that aid is being framed by voices on the ground and not by our own understanding or assumed understanding of the situation on the ground. And that's why, what I think you are moving away. This is how you're moving away from colonization. This is you are moving towards a rights-based approach. 
I don't know if I, this is a very complex question. It will probably take a whole doctoral thesis just to answer that question, but I hope I started a little bit. Yes, we can be part of the colonization system and a very capitalist in not the best way system, but we can also challenge this and reframe it. And that's where innovation is needed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so Courtney asks, do you have any thoughts on community based participatory action research in yes. regards to international social work? It's, it's absolutely mandatory, I would say. Participatory action research is one type of research that you should you know, become knowledgeable in. What does that mean? What is participatory action research? Well, first of all, it starts with the community. You engage voices from the community. When? Because Many times we're doing that, but you know when we are doing that? At the beginning, when we want to really introduce the project that we already prepared and shaped and framed. And at the end, when we come back and we say, this is what we found, and then we leave. This is not participatory action research. Participatory action research means that I'm going in with an open mind. I have some ideas, I might, you know, but I, I might depend on a contract, but I'm going into the community and the community starts shaping the project with me. Right. We are right now working on a project here in New York that is looking at access and utilization of health and mental health care by uh, women asylum seekers in New York City. And one approach would be to start, you know, studying, seeing where the gaps are and then providing responses. We chose not to do that. We chose to actually bring in a group of 12 women asylum seekers that are working with us from understanding the issues to shaping the survey to really looking at what questions matter to interpreting the results and then to advocating creating tools to advocate for changes absolutely if you work if you work whenever you will work so it's not an if whenever you work with communities really engaging with the communities it's vital it's crucial for social work in general and international social work in particular. Think about the fact that you are going to communities you know nothing about. No matter how much you read, you will not be culturally competent in these communities. I'm not culturally competent in my own community for Pete's sake. It still surprises me every day. So really learning from the community, allowing the community to inform you, me, but also validating that knowledge. It's not only that they inform me and now I'm using it to shape whatever I want to do. No, really validating that knowledge in what we do throughout the process is what community-based participation is and what community-based participatory action research should be. Yes. You ask two good questions and I get too passionate about them, I'm sorry. Thank you, Dr. Popescu. Um, Hannah, do you have anything else to add for the end? Um, I just first, Dr. Popescu, do not apologize. Those were wonderful answers. And I, I really want to thank our participants for asking such thought provoking questions. Um, for the sake of time, we really want to be mindful because we have gone over. We're going to wrap it up now. But I really want to encourage all of you to, if you have any questions, there were a couple that were in the chat that we're not able to get through, please um, email them to Dr. Popesco and she will be able to respond. Um, we are also going to have the slides sent out as well as the results from the Google networking form. If not tonight, then tomorrow, as soon as possible, we will have that for you. Um, I do want to also add in that we will send yeah. with the recording as well. So um, we're just going to package yes. everything up for you so that you're not getting too many emails. But please do know that that will get we will get that to you. Yeah, and um, just I just wanted to thank everyone again. I want to thank all our facilitators, all our presenters, and all of our wonderful attendees for coming and making today such a unique and wonderful student conference. Um, we hope that you will also be joining us for Social Work Day at the United Nations this Tuesday, March 16th. It's going to be a wonderfully unique experience, just like this one was, as we are all navigating doing things virtually. And now you can finally feel free to mute yourselves and say goodbye to everyone, and we thank you again.